Hey guys, welcome to Arise with Amber. Thank you guys. If you have been with me for a while, thank you for coming back every week. If you are new here, welcome. I'm so happy to have you here on my little tiny corner of the internet. Thank you guys for finding this podcast or if somebody sent it to you, I'm grateful. Perhaps I met some of you um, a couple of days ago at the Choctaw Women's Event in Oklahoma. I was able to speak at the Testify Conference. And so I, a lot of you guys messaged me and asked me where I'm speaking or you know, when can I come see you? And so I want to provide my messages to all of you who perhaps can't travel to come see me speak. So that's what we're doing today. I am going to just intro the video quickly and then we are going to put the video from the Testify Conference right after this little intro so you guys can hear my message. I titled it The Seminary of Suffering and it was a very sweet time with a lot of ladies there and I hope you enjoy it. So welcome to Arise with Amber, the podcast, and this is my talk from Choctaw, Oklahoma, a couple of days ago. Enjoy. You guys are chosen. Speaking of things happening, and, and we know whenever, any time we try to put something like this on, that the enemy is going to try to attack it, and he's going to do everything that he can to make it not happen. So what a blessing. We were so blessed by you. Thank you so much for showing up, and... It was beautiful, and I, <laughs> the enemy tried to get me to not be here too, guys. <laughs> I was getting ready to leave, and we, uh, we live on a little farm, and we have a bird dog, and her, we have a perimeter collar. Well, her collar went out, and we also have 14 chickens. So I am chasing my dog around, trying to get chickens out of her mouth. Uh, yeah, it was, they're all okay, but there's feathers all over my yard. Um, I did not want my daughter to come home to a, her pets being not there anymore. So, and then I drove with my mom. She's here with me tonight and we're on our way and we're like, we're about two hours into our drive and my stepdad calls and he's like, because he follows her on her phone. He's like, you're going the wrong way. You guys are like two hours the wrong way. You're not going to make it. He's like, Cindy, you're going the wrong way. You need to turn around. I guess we thought that because the town is Choctaw, we thought it was by the casino. So he thought we were supposed to be by the casino. And he's like, you guys just keep on going and going and going. You need to turn around. Thankfully, we made it, and we are here. So my dad was wrong. I was not going the wrong way. Um, but it is such a joy to be with you ladies here tonight. And we have been in prayer for all of the hearts that are in this room. And I'm so thankful that you guys are, are welcoming me here. And I just want to say what a, pr a privilege it is that we get to gather in a room like this and have fellowship and profess our faith in Christ. And there's so many around the world who don't have that liberty. So it's not lost on me that we get to do that, and I'm grateful to be here. I want to start off just by thanking you all for showing up today. I know what it takes to show up to something like this. I know I'm sure you're all busy moms or grandmas or daughters or sisters or friends or everything that you have to do to get here. And I'm sure many of you um, might be carrying some heavy things. And I don't know what you walked in here with tonight but I can imagine that a lot of you might be going through some, some seasons of suffering, some dark times, some wilderness seasons. And I want you to know that I see you and that the Lord sees you and that nothing that the Lord does, as, as you said, was, is by accident. He's not surprised by anything. You're in this room for a purpose. And the Lord has placed you right here to hear his word today. So thank the sister sitting next to you. If they invited you, that you're here. And I'm, I'm just grateful to be here with you guys. <laughs> oh, I hear some thanks, thanking going on. Well, my name is Amber Smith. I'm a wife, I'm a mother, I'm a daughter, I'm a sister, I'm a friend. But above all of those things, I'm a sinner saved by the grace of God. Amen. And I am, I mean, we sang all those songs. I don't know if, if they knew what I was going to talk about tonight, but all of those songs are in my message about singing the goodness of God. And I love how the Lord works. And I'm only here by the grace of God. And he saved me. And I want to tell everyone about it. And I have some photos of my family um, over here, they're kind of old photos, but that's my husband Granger. He is a was a touring musician. Um, he's actually coming in September, so you guys need to come back and hear him. Um, our daughter London, she is now 12, and my son Lincoln is now 10. We have little River, uh, red hair. He is forever three, and he is now um, with Jesus. And um, Maverick is our two-year-old little miracle baby that we didn't think that we would have. So just a few years ago, the idea of standing in front of a room of people telling my story was unthinkable. I, I'm not good with a microphone. My husband is the good one with the microphone. <laughs> so it just made me realize how much we can make all the plans in the world 
And we can, we can plan out our life for how we think it's going to go, but the Lord directs our steps. And it's often in ways that we never would have thought imaginable. I want to pray with you quickly just before I get into my message, and then we will get into it. Lord Jesus, we are so thankful to be here together tonight to have fellowship, Lord. Thank you for what you've done to bring every single heart into this room. Lord, I pray tonight, God, that somebody hears a word from you, Lord, that they feel your presence, that they feel your closeness. God, if there's any hardened hearts in this room, would you soften them, soften them to hear your word. Thank you for what you've done for us on the cross, God. May I decrease, Lord, as you increase. Thank you for who you are. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, this week, my family and I were remembering my, my wonderful um, father-in-love who passed away 10 years ago this week. And he was the most gentle, kind man. He was a big man. He was probably 6'4", six, 6'5". Six, and he would have been intimidating to some, but he just had the most kind, gentle spirit. And he loved his wife. He loved his three boys. He was a man of integrity. He loved the simple things. He loved ranching. He loved black coffee. He loved making friends at the feed store. And pretty much anywhere he, meant, anywhere he went, he made good friends. One day about 12 years ago, he shared a verse with me. We were talking about suffering, and we were talking about the Lord. And mind you, I'm not regenerate at this point. I'm not a follower of Christ. But he so lovingly and kindly shared um, 2 Corinthians 12, 9 with me. My grace is sufficient for you. My power is made perfect in weakness. And I never knew how much I would need that verse. First, when we lost him three years later to a sudden heart attack. And then when we lost our son to a drowning in our backyard five years later. The reality is, ladies, that this world is not the way it's supposed to be. Because of the fall, there is sin and sickness and death, and all of these things entered in, and it's not the way God intended it to be. I think we can all agree that we live in a fallen, broken world, and we see and experience pain everywhere we look. I know just in my friend circle alone, there is everything from disappointment to disease to divorce to destruction, despair, diagnosis, and yes, death. And those are just the D words of the alphabet. If one of us lives long enough in this fallen world, we will all face suffering. It comes to us in all shapes and sizes. No one is immune from it. And if you haven't suffered yet, you will. It's just promised in this life. I was crying this week for a friend of mine for, for everything that she's having to endure because even though I've walked through very dark times, it can always be worse. And the Bible doesn't shy away from suffering. You know, Jesus even says, in this world you will have tribulation, but take heart, I have overcome the world. We're not exempt from it. You know, God, from Genesis to Revelation, it's revealed that God's people have, have been brought through suffering. They endure trials. They endure, endure testing. But you know what we also read is that we are never, ever alone. He is with us through everything that we face. And in the midst of it, what the enemy meant for evil, we read that God meant for good. And then he is redeeming all things for his glory. We read in Isaiah 43, But now, thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, Fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overwhelm you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, and the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. God never, ever says that our life will be free from pain and heartache. In fact, he tells us, not if you go through tribulation, but when, not if you go through the fire, but when you walk through the fire, you will not be consumed. That should be an encouragement to us, that he is with us, and that even though we're being brought to the fire, we will not be consumed. And it should be encouragement to us that we have the most wonderful comforter in our pain. Not only that, but that this pain is not only predicted, it's promised. God's word tells us that he is good. We read that he is good. We read that he is sovereign, meaning that he controls all things. Nothing happens outside of his control. That his loving kindness that we just sang about endures forever. And if there is suffering and he is good, then there has to be purpose in everything that God brings our way. 
So since we live in this fallen state and pain and suffering are inevitable for every single one of us in this room, this side of heaven, the question becomes, what are we going to do with it? How will we walk through it? Will we waste it? When the unexpected, unwanted, tragic things of this world come knocking, where are you going to turn? Will you avoid it? Will you stuff it away? Will you try to escape from it? Will you medicate it? Or will you run to the helper? Will you run to the healer? And will you let this pain push you deeper into the arms of Christ where your help comes from? He is the one that is, that is pulling you into light and peace. He is your only light and peace. I'm willing to bet that many of you here this evening didn't experience the goodness of God on your mountaintop moments. Sure, we can see the, the goodness of God all around us, the breath in our lungs, the, the sun and the moon and the stars, the beautiful babies. We can experience God's goodness all around us, the common grace that he gives. But I'm willing to bet that many of you, if you know the Lord intimately, it was in those moments, in those moments where he brought you to your knees, where you cried out, where you surrendered, God, I can't do this. I need you, where you finally came to the end of yourself. The same is true for me. I would have said that I knew God. I would, have, I would have told you that Jesus died for my sins, but I didn't truly know him. I didn't have a relationship with him. I didn't know this Jesus that was light and peace. I didn't know him until the days and the weeks and the months and the years following the night of June 4th, 2019. On June 4th, my seemingly perfect little life went up in flames when our son, just after dinner, had somehow found his way into our locked pool gate. I was inside taking a shower. My husband was outside with the kids. He was doing gymnastics with our daughter, and our two little boys were playing with water guns. And the next thing I know, I, I heard my daughter scream, and all I heard was, I'm sorry, all I heard was river and pool. And so I'm in, I'm in my bedroom, and I get up, and I, I'm thinking that river might still be in the water. So as I'm running out, you know, the, the words come out of my mouth, where's daddy? And by the time those words came out of my mouth, I saw my husband doing CPR on our lifeless son inside the pool gate. It was quick, and it was silent, and in a matter of seconds, our family was broken. When you face a loss of that magnitude, when you see your purple, lifeless son on the ground, when you have to pick out a tiny casket and burial clothes, you don't know if you will ever smile again. You don't know if you will ever find joy. Can't even see through my tears, y'all. <laughs> Nothing makes sense. You know, you think, how could this happen? Why? Where are you, God? The grief at times did feel all-consuming. But two of my favorite words in the Bible, but God. God's word tells us we will walk through the fire, but we are not alone. Thank you, I had one in my pocket. <laughs> but we are not alone. And the flames will not consume you. And I think some people, when they see me standing up here or they hear my podcast, they might have thought that I, I always had this faith. I didn't always have this faith. I didn't know God until my mid-30s. I began to feel conviction when my husband and I got married. I began to feel like, we need to get our kids in church. I just felt like that was the right thing that we needed to do. We need to, get, we need to give them a firm foundation. So about a year before we lost our son, I began going to, um, I began going to church, been going to Bible studies, and I, I came to women's conferences just like this. And I really began to feel a peace in my life, and I felt like, okay, I'm going in the right direction. Our kids are in church. Like, I'm feeling good. And then we lost our son. And I look back on that time now, I didn't in the moment, but now I can see that God was preparing my heart. He was preparing my heart for that whole year, giving me scripture, giving me people that would walk us through this suffering. And I thank him now for that. He might be doing that for some of you this evening. You might, he might be preparing you for things that you don't know that are coming. I knew that I had a choice after we lost our son. I could shut down, I could give up, I could turn away from the Savior that, I, that I'd been learning about, or I could run full force into his arms and into his word. I had two children, my daughter was seven, my son was five, and I had a husband, so giving up was not an option for me. 
Each day as I cried out to God, sometimes just laying prostrate on the floor, he gave me just enough to keep going. Each day he drew me closer and closer to his feet, closer and closer to his word. Each day he showed me that he alone is my portion. He showed me that I couldn't do this on my own strength and I didn't have to. But it took me surrendering and it took me laying everything down, laying everything at his feet, giving it all to him and saying, it's yours, Lord, I can't do it. His word says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy burdened, and I will give you rest. That verse that my father-in-law shared with me became real. He showed me that his grace is sufficient. In my pain, each day, sometimes breath by breath, he called me to arise. He called me to seek him, and he called me just to take the next step. I don't mean to minimize anyone's pain here today. I don't know if any of you are grieving or suffering. You might be on day one. I know this is a process. It took me that we're, going, we're about to be on year five of losing our son. It's a process. It's messy. It's hard. I, I wrestled with God. I screamed. I cried. I, I punched my steering wheel. But I never turned away. I kept leaning into God. And I think oftentimes, you know, in grief, we think, how can I do this the rest of my life? How can I live without my, my loved one? For so many years, how can I do that? I can't live this way. But we have to remind ourselves that we don't have to do it forever. We just have to do it today. Because God's mercies are new every morning. You only have to do it right now. God doesn't allow his daughters to be consumed. He promises us that. But we cannot give up when life gets hard. We cannot run away from the Savior when things don't go our way. That's exactly what the enemy wants. He wants you stuck there. He wants you to question the goodness of God. That's been his motive from the beginning of time. God says in his word to fear not that he is with us through it all. It is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Every individual that God called and chose and used mightily in scripture went through seasons of hardship. They went through seasons of wilderness. This is just one of the reasons why reading your Bible is so important. If you are not in the word of God, you're not going to hear about Job, who lost everything, who thought it would be better that he wasn't even born. But then you're going to miss that. Though God allowed Satan to take everything from him, he got back double. If you're not in the word, we don't read about Elijah, who actually wanted God to let him die. Or Joseph, who was sold and betrayed by those that were closest to him. But we learn that what the enemy meant for evil, God meant for good. Hagar felt abandoned and alone. Esther risked her life for the Jewish people. David lamented, how long, O Lord? The, the Psalms are full of lament. But through all of that, we see God was right there, calling them up, calling them out, strengthening, strengthening them, feeding them, giving them naps, healing them, redeeming them, and transforming them. If you are tempted to think no one understands my pain, you don't know what I've been through. You don't know what I've endured. You only have to look to the cross. God's own son was beaten and nailed to a cross for you and for me so that we could be brought back into right relationship with him. He lovingly and willingly laid down his life. He took the wrath of God that we deserve. Our sins are what nailed him to it. And he was buried and resurrected and rose the third day, and by belief and trust in him, we get the right to be called sons and daughters of God. That is the best news ever. If all the people that God called in scripture and used mightily for his glory, if they weren't able to escape suffering, why would we think that we would be any different? If God didn't spare his own son, why would we think that we would get out of this life without any scars? And why? <laughs> would we think that if God brought them through it all, that he wouldn't do the same for us? Our Lord is not absent from our pain. Our amazing Savior stepped down from glory and entered into our suffering with us. People say, you know, where's God? Where's God in this? He entered into our suffering with us and died the death that we deserve. All of this suffering has purpose. It's not accidental. It's not meaningless, and the fiery trials that each of you are facing in this room are not meaningless either. So why? 
Why does God allow it? Why is there so much suffering? 1 Peter 1, 6 through 7 says, You have been grieved by various trials, so that the tested genuineness of your faith, more precious than gold, that perishes, though it is tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. The Bible tells us that the testing of our faith is more precious than gold. Psalm 66.10 says, For you, O God, have tested us. You have tried us as silver is tried. You brought us into the net. You laid a crushing burden on our backs. You let men ride over your heads. We went through the fire and water, yet you have brought us out to a place of abundance. That's another word that I love in, in Scripture is yet. Yet you brought us out. The words of God should be an encouragement to his sons and daughters, to those who mourn especially. I've had people tell me that God had nothing to do with my son's death, that it was either a senseless accident or it was all Satan. But that puts the power in the wrong place. I'll tell you what the Bible says. The Bible says every one of our days are numbered. Everyone from the beginning of the foundation. He knit us together in our mother's womb. He knows our days. We all have our day. God knew the day that he would call my son home. And God knew that I would be standing here today singing of his goodness. I firmly believe that God will do anything to bring you to his feet. He will do anything to transform a heart. That might not always mean a tragic, a tragedy like mine, but it can. Oswald Chambers says, if through a broken heart, God can bring his purposes to pass in this world, then thank him for breaking your heart. That takes some time to get to the thankfulness. <laughs> but nothing comes to you unless it passes through our Savior's nail-scarred hands. He either ordains it or he allows it, but he is not absent from it. He's given Satan dominion over this world for a time, but his time is short. Do we understand it? No. Do we want it? No. Does it hurt? Yeah. But can we trust him? Absolutely. But the only way that we can get to a place of trust is if we know him is if we know the God of Scripture, not the God, not this prosperity God that wants you happy, healthy, and wealthy, the God of the Bible. I don't know why our prayers for Rivers Healing didn't happen the way that we wanted them to. I don't know why some other children miraculously survive a drowning. I don't know. It's hard. Those are hard for me. But I praise God for that. I praise God. But I know that God is good, and I know that I trust him. And I know that his ways are higher, and I will never understand the mind of God. He wouldn't be God if we could understand. 1 Peter 4.12 says, Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery ordeal when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. James 1, 2, and 4 says, Count it all joy. My brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds, for you know that the testing of your faith produces steadfastness, let steadfastness have its full effect, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. It's hard to count it all joy when you're in it, but I can look back now, and I have joy again. I think there's a picture up there, that picture right there in the center. I didn't know if I would ever smile like that again. But in his grace... He has brought joy from suffering, and grief and joy can coexist. I still have days where I cry, but I have joy because my joy comes from the Lord. It's not from anything in this world. It's from the peace that I have from God. Ladies, this pain, this heartache, this diagnosis, this sickness, this death, it's refining you. It is purifying you. It is bringing you to the feet of Jesus. It is pruning things away from you like sin and idols. It is bringing you to our Lord. It's growing your faith, and it's making you more like Christ. It's enabling you to have compassion on others who might endure the same things that you're suffering right now. It's preparing for you an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. This is what's called the seminary of suffering. This is holy ground. It's holy ground because the Lord is with you. It truly is where we learn what we're made of, is in the darkness, is on our knees. 
is in the pain. God is more concerned with your holiness and your heart posture toward him and your address for eternity than he is with your comfort. And that's a hard pill to swallow. Through all of these trials that we read about in Scripture, we, we can see God's hand. And we can trace his heart for his people. And I pray that none of you have to go through some of the devastating things that I'm sure some of you are walking through right now. But I pray that if you do, you run to him. We must have a firm foundation like we sang about, or we're going to crumble like sand when life hits us. When the things of this world threaten to take you out, you have to be rooted and planted in the word of God. God says over and over, though we face these trials to fear not, he reminds us that though trials will come, he is with us. And I'm going to keep repeating that to you so you know that he is with you through everything that you are facing. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. And when you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. What a promise that is from our creator, from the one who calls us his. We have the greatest comforter in our deepest pain. We were driving with our kids the other day, and we saw, we saw smoke, and we drove past this, this pretty large burned area, and my kids got really scared, and they were like, oh my goodness, that looks really bad. I hope everyone's okay. And my husband Granger said that it, it looks, he's like, oh guys, that looks like a controlled burn. I'm not sure if you guys, you probably are, it's Oklahoma. You guys know what controlled bur burns are. <laughs> Sometimes I'm in a different state. <laughs> And, you know, controlled burns are prescribed burns. They're set on purpose. They are monitored because there's benefits to them. Some of the benefits include removing, removing vegetation for new growth, shifting soil nutrients for a more favorable state. They help reduce the spread of invasive plants. They consume things that are already dead, such as downed trees, and it reduces the risk of more intense fires. And so as soon as we told the kids, you know, the benefits of the controlled burn, they went from, oh, that looks really bad, to, that's pretty cool. And so sometimes, you know, I think... When we have our eyes on the things of this world, things can look really bad. But when we look to the one who we know has it all in his hands, I don't know if I'd say a lot of the things are pretty cool, but <laughs> we can know that he has a purpose and he has a plan. And that though things in this world look scary and dark, that we can see if we look to, to our Savior that it, it does have a planned purpose. And it begins to make a little bit more sense. I've heard many grieving mothers say, there is no purpose in this. There is no good that can come from the death of my child or the sickness of my child. And I, I grieve with them because it's really hard. It's a hard thing to walk through. But I have come to see good from our loss. Our son donated two of his organs. I met, I met the recipient of his right kidney. She was on dialysis for three years his entire life. And she is happy and healthy. She lives in Austin. So that's good that came. It's brought many people back to reading their Bibles. Many people sought the Lord in prayer after hearing our story. We set up a foundation to give back, and we, we've been able to give back over half a million dollars to people in need. My husband has left his touring career. He was a musician for 24 years, and the Lord did a mighty work in his life, saved him, saved us. And he put his guitar down. He's enrolled in seminary, and now he goes around preaching, telling the goodness of God. And that is good. <laughs> I now get to travel and share the good news of what the Lord has brought me through and what he will bring you through. We now have the sweetest little tractor-loving two-year-old that wasn't in our plan. <laughs> but he was in God's plan. And he's the best. And he's never a replacement for River. But he is such a joy. He is such a joy in our lives. And he was always supposed to be here. God knew that. Sisters, we have to take our eyes off the problems of this world and turn our eyes up to our Savior, the one who created us, the one who calls us his. Our sovereign Lord, in his love for us, sometimes prescribes these fires and these burns for our good and for his glory. If he just removed every single ob obstacle that we had, we would never turn to him. We would never need him. He would never be glorified. We would never learn anything. It's there in the fire where we are purified and refined and brought out as gold. I had said that Granger and I, you know, we were living a, a seemingly good life before we lost our son. We, we had a nice home. We had healthy kids. We had two dogs and a cat. We bought a piece of land. We actually had like a white picket fence, y'all. It was, it, was, it was awesome. But we weren't living for God. We had no fruit. We weren't following Christ. 
we would say that we were cultural Christians, so to speak, which I think so many people are, and they don't even realize it. You know, you go to church, you say that you know God, but do you? Do you have fruit? Is your life evident of a life transformed and surrendered to God? Because ours wasn't. And I tell people that God brought us through something that almost killed us to make us alive in him. It was in and through the loss of our son that we surrendered our lives to Christ. I mean, Granger grew up in a Christian family his whole life. But he was saved on, in, in March of 2020. The Lord broke into his heart. The Bible tells us that through many trials, we will enter the kingdom of heaven. But on earth, we want to escape those trials. We don't want pain. Nobody wants pain. We want a happy, nice, healthy, comfortable life. We want the kingdom and we want eternity, but we don't want to suffer like Jesus. We want the crown, but we don't want the cross. And you know, all of us are called to be like Jesus. But I once read, if you want to be like Jesus, you have to remember, he had a wilderness, he had a Gethsemane, and he had a Judas. Isaiah 49, 13 says, For the Lord hath comforted his people and will have mercy upon his afflicted. There is such sweet solace knowing that the Lord is our comforter. When we can't see past the tears, as I couldn't just a second ago, we have to remember the promises of his word. When the enemy is lying to you, speaking lies into your life, you have to go to the word of God. We say, it is written. He reminds us that this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory. And I know that these pains hurt so badly. And this life can seem so long, but it is so short in light of eternity. I'm here to tell you that the pain that you are walking through is not meaningless. But if you are trusting in anything other than Jesus, it can feel that way. It can feel like none of it makes sense. I don't want to do this. I can't do this. This is all pointless. I want us to be women who keep our eyes, our minds, and our hearts on Jesus the author and the perfecter of our faith. And I want us to be women who know that he will never let us be consumed. I want us to be women who arise through adversity. I want us to be women who clothes ourselves in armor of God and go to battle for our brothers and sisters in the faith. I want us to be women who testify of the goodness of our Lord and Savior when we bring glory to God when we suffer well. And I want us to be women, this is the hardest part, who can thank God for breaking our hearts sometimes, who can thank God for what he's done in our lives because it brought us to him, and that's the greatest gift that we could ever be given. Octavius Winslow says, God has given us many precious gifts, but I believe that next to the unspeakable gift of his beloved son, we shall thank and praise him the loudest in heaven for the gift of suffering. You guys have a choice how you are going to walk through a wilderness season, a trial, a, t a, t a temptation. Grief and joy can coexist, and you have a choice in how you're going to emerge from those ashes if they come your way. You can come out strengthened and refined, and you can come out with a greater, deeper faith in your Savior. You can know, come out knowing that Christ is more precious than anything. And you can also emerge and shine his light for other people and help to call them out and help to comfort them in ways that you were comforted through everything that the Lord has brought you through. One of my favorite sentences in a book that I read when I was going through my suffering, it was called um, In a Boat in the Middle of a Lake. And the, the sentence was, Jesus, if you could love me in your suffering, I will love you in mine. How dare we turn our backs on the one who gave his life for us, who stepped down from glory and took on our sin, he loved us on that cross. He loved us in our sin. He loves you now. We have the promise of suffering all throughout the scriptures. God doesn't shy away from that, but I'll leave you with one more promise. 1 Peter 5.10 says, And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. He will restore. That doesn't always mean it's going to be in this life. Some of us might suffer chronic pain for a really long time. Some of us might grieve until we're called home. But he will restore when we see him in glory. And all will be made well. And there will be no more tears and no more death and no more sin 
and no more sickness. He will make all things new. I would have never written this story for my life. I would have never, none of us would have written in the pain if we would have written this story. But the author of life, our creator, is writing the most beautiful story, a, most, a more amazing story than I could have ever imagined by his pen. And I don't want to waste it. And I don't want you guys to waste it. You guys are loved and you are chosen and your story is not over. Thank you.